What's up, Eagles Nation? What's going on, NFL world? How you doing, division rivals? This is Stephen Heider with Gate City Sports Channel, the sports channel where the cerebral NFL fan comes for about 10 minutes of daily content. What's up, guys? If you're new to the channel, if you guys can do me a huge favor, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. And to all my OG subscribers, I'm going to try to make this one quick, guys, because I'm going to get into the topic. Y'all can hit that like button. That's what communicates with YouTube. Let's know we're out here and pushes this, you know, across the platform. All right, y'all, let's jump into today's topic. So I had these series of videos lined up that I wanted to make, and then the Eagles just kept making moves and things kept happening. So I felt like, okay, I'm going to have to shift things a little bit, and it might be time to address the Corey Underland situation. So as we all found out yesterday, Corey Underland has essentially what it seems like is he's going to take over as the defensive coordinator of the Detroit Lions. Not really a big surprise. Him and Matt Patricia have a longstanding relationship. A um, little surprised at the timing of when it happened. And the fact that I didn't hear a lot coming downhill about this one. I mean, normally you kind of have, you know, a little bit of an, an idea that something like this is going to happen. I, you know, I'll give Matt Patricia and his staff credit because I didn't hear crap about this coming down the line. It kind of, I think, shocked us all. But I'll be honest with you. Who cares? I'll be honest with you. I wasn't a big fan of Corey Underland anyways. All right, y'all. Let's jump into today's topic. 13. This is 12. Hey, Doug, what personnel are you in? That uh, that clip explains so much, doesn't it? 13, this is 12. Bro, we got defensive players out there doesn't even know what the personnel package is, the offense is in. God, that doesn't explain so damn much. Now I'm just joking. All right, y'all. So let's get into Corey Underland. I don't know if Corey Underland was responsible for what was going on with the coverage schemes or if it's more Jim Schwartz. I don't know. I don't personally care because I don't think the coverage schemes were the main component of the problem. I think sometimes the player and personnel decisions made in certain packages, especially sub packages, and later on, how crappy our secondary was at communicating was the larger issue that was at hand underneath Corey Underland's tutelage. And we can talk a lot. There are positives and there are negatives to Corey Underland and what he did here as the you know defensive backs coach. He was the most senior guy we had. He predated even you know our, our current administration here. He was. Here before Jim Schwartz. He was here before Doug Peterson, right? He's part of that Chip Kelly staff that was brought in. So, I mean, he's been here for a long time. He's been a coach in a league for a very long time. He came out from the New England coaching tree. He's well respected around the league. I'll be honest with you. I just, I wasn't that impressed, man. I know that he's done things like with rookie, you know, undrafted free agents where you, you get guys who come in here and, and they have big impacts. We had, you know, a rookie last year that played pivotal, you know, roles all across the board. But if I can be honest, if you take out like Avante Maddox, did he play better as the nickelback? Well, should I say this? Not better. Were you more impressed with him playing nickel on the outside or when he had to line up as a safety? Because if you're like me, you were more impressed with him having to play safety and how well he did there. But that wasn't Corey Underland. That was Tim Hawk. <laughs> so I, I don't know, guys. The one thing I will say is this. Underneath Corey Underland, the Eagles love to run single high safety looks, okay? Our base was, generally speaking, like a cover three. It gives you a lot of protection against the run. And then when you got an obvious passing down in distances, you would see the Eagles play a lot of cover one with an occasional time where they might drop back into like a cover two concept or mostly what you saw a lot of Corey Underland was a lot of cover four when we did these weird zone things. And I'll be honest with you, the biggest problem I had with him was when we were in that cover four, Bro, we could not communicate in the secondary. It was laughable how bad the communication was. And I'll be damned if we didn't get beat play after play in certain games in cover four. I, it's not that hard. You're playing a quarter of the field. You're literally taking 53 and a half feet and dividing it by four. And now those four guys only have to cover, you know, that with the field. That's the whole point of it. If you can't communicate in that, then that coverage is worthless. And you know what? I'm just going to roll to the film and let's talk. Dozens first down going deep for Diggs. So I'll be honest with you. When I first saw that play, I knew it wasn't on Rasul Douglas. I, as a matter of fact, I went on the record and was trying to tell people like, no, no, no. You guys don't know what you're talking about if you're saying that because you haven't played enough corner in your life to understand the technique that Rasul Douglas was in. Rasul was playing a trailing technique and he's clearly making sure he's taking away the outside portion of the field from him. He's 
doing what he's supposed to do, which is diverting the route inside. Now, where I missed on is I didn't see the original coverage scheme. So I thought it was like a cover two or something of that sort. I didn't know that it was a cover four concept at first. And then I saw it on the All Coaches 22. And I was like, oh, big time mistake. So the Vikings, I got to give them credit because they, they clearly had seen something about Corey Underland on film. By the way, good luck, Corey Underland. You're going to see them twice a year now. But they ran their tight end or, or another receiver. I don't remember anymore who it was. They ran him right across the face of both safeties. And both safeties bit on that tight end. Now, when I originally saw it, I thought they were in a cover two. So I was thinking to myself, like, well, what are you doing, Rasul? Like, you've got to take away that safety. I'm sorry. You've got to take away that crosser, that crossing route that's coming down to your portion of the quarter coverage. And you got to dump that off. You know, you got to push that route off to Rodney McLeod because he's in position to defend it. Now, later on, what we end up finding out is because they were in quarters coverage, no, McLeod did what he was supposed to do. That was his concept there to take that underneath. And that was supposed to be communicated between him and Malcolm Jenkins. And Malcolm Jenkins was supposed to, to take that back end off that was back there. So communication, man. He just, this was not, <laughs> there was a lot of issues with the secondary. And communication was a major, major issue with, with this particular, you know, administration underneath Corey Underland. It just wasn't very good. Both safeties have their eyes on the underneath drag route and leave that top wide open. In my opinion, when you look at a play like that, you're in the right call. Like, they know that this team can stretch the field vertically. They've got a vertically, you know, a defensive coverage scheme that should take away that vertical option. But because these guys don't communicate correctly and they're out of place, look, Minnesota does its best to confuse the safeties. It runs that long drought route right in front of the face of both safeties. Both of them bite on it, and that top is taken off. And... This is the problem I had with Corey Underland's system in general. I just, I don't, you know, I don't think that they were bad in the play calls. I think they were just really bad in the execution and the coaching standpoint of where these guys are supposed to be. Proper technique to defend, you know, balls. And that's what I want to transition into now, which is, look, if, as I went through and I was like paying attention a little bit as I've been breaking down film throughout this whole offseason, I'll just give you guys a little heads up of the first five games I've pretty much gotten through right now. So in Washington, Early on in the game, they attacked us with a lot of runs. Late in the game, as they're trying to play catch up, they go pass on first down. You go to Atlanta. Atlanta tries to run on us a lot early. Detroit was the only one where I felt like Detroit was just, they they were going to throw. They had Matthew Stafford. They got those receivers. They don't have the greatest of running games there. They were going to throw the football, and they threw the football a lot. <laughs> and then when you get into games like Green Bay, Green Bay threw it a little early, and then they diverted into running the ball with Aaron Jones. The only other, you know, well, you go to week five and you look at the Jets. The Jets, of course, started off trying to run the ball, couldn't get any, you know, rhythm with running the ball. And then they started trying to throw the ball. That didn't work. So they had to go back to the running game, which if you, you know, just take the Jets game as a sample here, guys. On the first 10 first downs, let's see, they ran the ball one, two, three, four, five, six, six out of 10 times on first down. Cover three is the right call in that situation. Eight people in the box gives you that run protection. But some teams did pick up on that down the stretch. And the one thing that the cover three is very weak at is it's weak at covering the flats. And I just thought that there were times we became very predictable in things like this. And I think teams were aware of that. And we've got to find a way of being in something like a cover three, but giving some kind of a look or something that maybe makes it at least seem like we're going to be in a cover one or, you know, makes it so they're not just going to completely attack the flats real quick on us. And that was the problem I had all season with Corey Underland. Sanu makes the catch, slips it. In my opinion, when you have this combination of, you know, Jim Schwartz and Corey Underlin, it just seemed like they weren't really aware of the strengths and weaknesses of their own personnel and put it in. If they were aware, then they were not putting them in down in distances and situations that suited their strengths. Because on the second and four, which seems like, you know, given what was going on in terms of the offense, and given what was going on in terms of the defense we lined up and we clearly were expecting run, but we still have to play a little bit on that pass coverage. Having a guy out there like Ronald Darby out there, it's a mistake. Like, Ronald Darby's not a good tackling corner. Like, why would you leave him exposed on the outside like that? I mean, you already have safety help over the top. You got eight defenders in the box. Put your better players who can, like, I would have rather had Rasul Douglas and Sidney Jones out there. 
because Rasul's a very short tackler. He's one of the better ones we have on the football team. And Sidney Jones, while tackling isn't necessarily his strength, he's a lot better at it than Ronald Darby is. It's just a matter of knowing your personnel. Now I'm going to give you the all-22 look, and I'll give you the breakdown of the exact formations that each team lines up in. So, simply put, Atlanta comes out with a 21-man personnel. Okay, They have kind of that split back. For, well, it's not even split back. It's, it's more of an off-wing kind of uh, running back formation. So they got a lead back that's kind of off to the right. And then you got your running back who's behind your quarterback. So he's kind of in the back area about six yards deep. And then you have 21 men. So you got two running backs, a tight end, and two wide receivers. Your wide receivers on both ends of the field there. One-on-one, -on -one, you got a single high safety on the Eagles because we're clearly playing cover three. Great play call for the Eagles. I mean, cover three is a very good defense to line with when you're going against a 21-man personnel. It's going to give you eight defenders in the box. I mean, you could have stayed in base package, run a little 4-3 if you really wanted to, but I don't disagree with the cover three call. I don't think that was the problem. I think your problem is, is that you made a bad personnel decision. You got Ronald Darby out there, singled up one-on-one -on -one with Mohamed Sanu. Sanu's not that fast. I mean, he's like a four six ish kind of guy in the 40. He's not. He's by no, no means is he anywhere near as fast as Ronald Darby, but he's a more physical uh, football player. He's just a, a much better yards of the catch matchup for Atlanta versus a softer coverage corner. I mean, if this was more of a third and long distance and you're playing off, you know, in an off coverage, then Ronald Darby fits the mold of what you want out there. But this is just bad personnel decisions. And this is why I'm not a huge fan of Corey Underland. This is why I'm not really hurt by his decision to move on and go to the Detroit Lions. And I know that I always preach you better have something better if you plan on firing people. But I don't think it's going to be that far of a stretch of the imagination to think that we can probably find a little better coaching at, the, at that defensive back position. There were just several plays throughout the season. I mean, I'm not going to go through them all again, guys, because I've done them a million times. But go back to the Ronald Darby one-on-one -on -one with Devontae Parker matchup where I told you guys he has perfect body positioning. Everything about what Ronald Darby is doing is correct, except for he, cannot, he can't high point and place the ball when it's in the air. He doesn't turn and locate the football. And you guys have asked me before, what do you do in that situation? You take your hand and you come up. You got to come up through the hands of the receiver and pop that ball away. That's the way you play the ball. He doesn't do those little things that indicate good coaching. You know, you get guys like, you know, Ronald Darby. Ronald Darby's a good zone coverage guy. He has horrible angles that he takes to tank, tackle. That's coaching. You know, you go to a guy like Rasul Douglas. Rasul Douglas lacks certain speed to play one on one in press situations, but he's a very good read and react corner. He's very good at reading what's going on. It's why I think a lot of us think that Russell would make a really good safety. But you can't have him matched up one-on-one -on -one with dynamic playmakers all the time and expect that he's going he's gonna to win that more than 50% of the time. He's probably going to lose it. Probably more than 50% of the time he's going to lose that. It's not a fair matchup. You know, that goes to Sidney Jones. Sidney Jones just does not quite grasp enough of the defense yet to play zone. He's not a read and react type corner. He's a, give me my guy. Let me lock up on this guy. And let me use my athletic gifts to beat this guy. We saw that down the stretch from Sidney Jones. Put him in on man coverage and he can make a play on the ball. I thought Sidney Jones played really well in his role down the stretch. I just think Corey Underlin wasn't that great of a coach. So in the end, my feelings aren't hurt. Good riddance. Good luck. Wish you the best. All right, guys. Let's go ahead and let's get into the nitty-gritty about who could be potential replacements for Corey Underlin. And I got to tell you, I'll give you guys some internal candidates, and I'll give you guys some external candidates. Listen, as much as we might need fresh eyes on certain positions, I do think that we, we can't just overrule certain players, like certain coaches moving up into position, like Deuce Daly. I would not be against Deuce Daly becoming the offensive coordinator of the Eagles. If that were to happen, I would be completely fine with that. Now, I do think the Eagles probably could benefit from bringing some fresh eyes, but I also think that Deuce Daly could bring fresh eyes, and I don't think that he would be like some kind of a weird hindrance to Doug's style. I think he would add to it. But I'd be okay with James Urban or anyone else coming from the offensive side. On this defensive side, let's just let's talk about who the internal candidates would be since I led with that whole Deuce thing. The internal candidates. Number one, I would say that you could consolidate the secondary underneath one coach because currently there's two coaches. I'm a huge fan of Reuben Frank. I, you know, I love Reuben Frank. I, I listened to what he said. I got to tell you, I disagree with the point that 
that they made on that podcast about uh, giving credit to Corey Undlin about how Malcolm Jenkins was never a Pro Bowl player before he was underneath Undlin. Well, the thing is, he's not underneath Undlin. You're giving credit to the wrong guy. That's Tim Hawk. <laughs> Tim Hawk coaches the safeties. So I could see them consolidating power underneath Tim Hawk and giving Tim Hawk the position of just defensive backs coach and not having this difference between corner and safety coaches. Just one coach who has a bunch of assistants under him. Now, if they're going to keep this with a two kind of system thing where you're going to have a safety coach and they're going to have a cornerback coach, then I could see them going to a guy like Matt Burke, who they brought in here to be the special assistant coach, you know, for the defense. I could see him now assuming the role of being, you know, the defensive back coach. So being the corners coach, basically. Now, Matt Burke really has most of his experience with the linebackers. However, most good coaches can coach pretty much anywhere in terms of like linebackers, you know, defensive line, you know, they have enough knowledge to coach anywhere. I don't think that's like a thing that, that you know, that would deter him from being that. Now, we do have a guy named um, uh, Dino Vasso. Dino Vasso is the assistant that was underneath Underlin. There's a possibility he leaves the Eagles as well and goes to Detroit. But if he doesn't, I could see him being promoted to that defensive backs coach or corners coach instead of, you know, obviously if you don't consolidate into Tim Hulk as the secondary coach. I could see that happening. Outside candidates. There's a lot of really good outside candidates, but the chips have to fall in the right place for that to happen. Because a lot of these guys are former coaches, coordinators or like coaches, and that's going to be really hard. So my favorite, to be quite honest, would be Steve Wilkes. But that's a matter of, is this new coaching staff in Cleveland going to give him the job as a defensive coordinator again or retain him as their own secondary coach? Because Steve Wilkes is, you know, a renowned secondary coach. I would love to have him in here in Philly. He would do a good job here. And there's not a lot of people in Cleveland that I would beat the table to want here in Philadelphia. But he's one of those guys I think is an exception to the rule. Past Steve Wilkes, you would get a guy like, you know, um, Perry, I think it's Perry Fuel. Fuel, is that how he says his name? F-E-W-E-L-L. The guy who coached in Carolina. He was the interim coach. He's been the uh, defensive backs coach in, you know, Carolina for a very long time. Their secondary coach. He's a good football coach. I would love to have him come into to this Eagles coaching staff. Past him, you get guys like Chris Richard. I'm not a huge, um, I'm not a huge backer of Chris Richard's style. I don't like the fact that he doesn't have the corners turn around and locate the football. Like, I like the system he runs. I just don't like the technique that he teaches his players. So I would be a little down on that one, but I'm not going to act like it's not a real, per, you know, probability. And then you got you get guys like Ray Horton, who was a long time. Well, I don't know if he was a long time, but he did coach in Washington for a little bit. Um, you know, he before this season, he was pretty high up on people's boards. They liked him a lot, Ray Horton. I don't like the way the season unfolded for the Redskins in the secondary. I don't know if that was due to talent, due to age, due to a lot of different things. Maybe it was outside of his control, but that's another guy that has been linked. So three internal guys, I gave you four external guys. This is kind of what I'm seeing right now going on. If you had to ask me what I think would happen, I think that they might try to promote Dino Dino Faso just to save him from going to Detroit. I could also see them moving Matt Burke since he's already on the coaching staff as an assistant coach. I could see them promoting him and moving him to that position. Or I don't know if that's necessarily a promotion, but moving him into that position. I could see that happening. And I wouldn't rule out Tim Hawk just taking over the secondary in general. Past that, I mean, I do think the Eagles will kick the wheels on guys like Steve Wilkes. I mean, he's a good coach. I can see them kicking the wheels on that. Um, I can see Perry Fool. I can see them kicking the wheels on that one. I mean, those two guys, I would be very excited to get in here in Philadelphia. All right, y'all, that's my thoughts. You tell me your thoughts. I'm out of here, guys. You know what time it is. E A E L E S. All right, y'all. Let's go Eagles. What do y'all think about that secondary for real, though, in terms of the coaching?